Okay, so um, when I was asked to do this presentation on beer cocktails, I don't think that Lauren knew how much of a cocktail guy I actually am, because I am. I love, love, love to make cocktails. Uh, and I'm, my, my wife will tell you that it's a bit of a problem because you end up with hundreds of bottles of stuff that you've used that much of. And so that's a bit of a problem. So it was not as much of a problem with a group for 40, which we seem to have more of than 40 now. Uh, and and I'll ne another disclaimer is I'm terrible at math. And when you're making cocktails, it's important to be good at math because you have to do ratios to get things good and get things right. And I barely knew what a ratio was. So that's a lie. I actually know. But so, so there's a lot of work that went into getting there. So anyway, tonight we're going to talk about beer cocktails. My first thing was, you want me to talk about beer cocktails? I don't even know what that is. I don't even know why that is. Because I love beer and I love cocktails, but I didn't know that you actually had them together until I realized that you do. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about beer cocktails and beer tales. And that's not a, a, a fun on words. It's actually something different that I learned in the process of going through this. And I want to thank in advance my, my guests. Uh, guest speakers are going to be on uh, Jeff Bagby from Bagby Beer Company. And, and, and our own Chris Banker of Barrel and Stave, who have contributed, contributed a ton to help me make this happen. So, so what we're going to talk about tonight are, first of all, what's the definition of a cocktail? What is a beer cocktail? Uh, we're, and then we're going to pour something. So you've already had a first pour of a rag, of Stiegel Rattler. Now, I don't know if anybody's had this before. Um, everybody's had some, I presume. Has, has everybody gotten some? Patrick, you did not get any? Oh, yeah, pour on. Yeah. Anybody else not get any? Jeff? Got some? Everybody? OK. So, so. Rattler is actually a beer cocktail. Well, it's more of a beer tail, technically, because it doesn't have liquor in it. It's just beer and lemon juice. They're super low alcohol, as you can see. The ABV is only like 2.4%. So you can smash these all summer long, and you won't feel jacked, except you'll feel pretty good because they're nice and refreshing and they're light. They make a grapefruit version of this. This is the lemon one. They make a, uh, a grapefruit one. They make a berry flavored one. And they're all delicious and super light. And technically, it's a beer tail. Everybody like, anybody not like this? It's not a test. And it's not, there's no wrong answer. So if you don't like it, it's OK. Patrick, you like it. They're really fun. Get these in the, for the summertime. Because if you go out to the river or go out on a boat, you can just just hammer them. They're really fun. Okay, so let's talk about what is a cocktail, technically. So, so you got your, your phonetic spelling right there. It's an, any alcoholic drink that contains alcohol, a spirit, and something else. It can be beer. It can be fruit. It can be fruit juice. It can be soda. It can be tonic. Whatever you want, that's a cocktail. So this obviously qualifies at some level. So these are the different cocktails that we're going to be drinking tonight. Uh, we're drinking in moderation. You're going to get three ounce pours. If it's if you feel like you're getting overserved, please cool it. Uh, we're going to have one cocktail that's going to be served the the uh, the drowning in passion from barrels and stave. That's Chris's cocktail. It's got almond in it. If anybody has a nut allergy to almonds, pass on the passion, uh, the drowning in passion from Chris. He made his own orgeat syrup, which if you know, can be purchased from every store on the planet from Torani or Torin. And there isn't one iota of almond in any of those almond syrups. I'll never buy them again. Chris made his own, and so it's got almond. Uh, the Grapefruit Moon. 
Uh, you can probably guess it has grapefruit in it. If anybody has an issue with grapefruit because of a medication you may take, like a statin or something for high blood pressure, they say there's issues with grapefruit juice. I take both of those and I'm still gonna have some. Because there's not a lot in it. Please, please don't drop dead tonight. No, no, no. It has to do with the way that it meets out. It has an effect on how the slow, the, the, the way your, your, uh, the, the medication goes into your bloodstream. So if I pass out, it's okay. You guys can serve yourselves. So these are the drinks. So, so Jeff has been kind enough to share his Michelada with us. We're gonna, we're gonna go with that. Are we doing Michelada first, guys, or are we gonna go with Chris's? Michelada coming first. So this is Jeff's proprietary Michelada mix. Uh, I'm gonna share with you on the slide the ingredients of that Michelada mix, this proprietary mixture. If you want an exact copy of the recipe afterwards, you're gonna to need to let me know and I'll let you know. We didn't wanna publish it out on the World Wide Web because this thing goes onto YouTube and it goes onto our website. And so we wanna kinda of hold it close for Jeff and protect his, his, uh, his stuff. <coughs> the Drowning in Passion is Chris's cocktail. Uh, and he's gonna he's gonna talk about it and Jeff's gonna talk about his Michelada when we get to it. Uh, it's it's a, a riff with his uh, passion fruit hard seltzer. And if you've ever had that before at Barrel and Stave, you'll say giddy up because it's delicious. And it's relatively low in, in alcohol as well until he made this. So this is going to boost it up quite a bit. Uh, and I'll show you as we go through the slides, you have the approximate ABV of each of these cocktails on the slides. Um, and I say approximate, there's an ish on every one. And because some of these cocktails are diluted with water, it's hard to tell exactly how much of that water makes into the dilution as it adds volume to the overall drink. I've learned how to do that math so I can do this. So make sure I wasn't getting everybody all liquored up with 25% uh, alcohol. Um, the, the ale punch is, uh, that's a powerful son of a gun there. Um, I'll talk about that when we get to it. That's got a lot of different stuff in it um, based on a pale ale. Uh, the grapefruit moon, as we talked about, grapefruit and Sam Smith's oatmeal stout. Hmm, sounds weird. It is freaking delicious. I tried it last night because I had to try one of these and it was delicious and I didn't pass out. So it's obviously gonna be okay. And the over the cuckoo's nest uh, is a is a very delicious one too. It's a it's a good finisher. It's got a uh, a nut a walnut liqueur base with uh, Jeff's Three Beagles Brown, which is a multi award winning brown beer from uh, from Bag. So so that's what we're going to be taking. Uh, are we ready to go with Michelada's pretty quick here, guys? We're almost ready on the Michelada. Jeff, you want to come up and uh, say a couple words and kind of talk about your inspiration for this Michelada and cocktail and all which I've learned from my last couple of months. I've been spending a lot of time up there, and uh, they make fantastic cocktails. So we've always thought their beers are just fantastic. Their cocktails are really good too, and they take a lot of pride in them. With that, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, yes, we do. That was one of the things I was going to say. We spend. A lot of time on our beer, obviously, that's our main focus, but our, our cocktail pro program, I'd put against, proud to say I'd put it against anybody's. Um, we spend a lot of time and a lot of research and a lot of work into what we do with our cocktails. Our, we pick our spirits very carefully. We make all our own syrups. All, of, all our juices are freshly squeezed. Um, so anyway, we spend a lot of time on it. Um, the Michelada, uh, this kind of came about uh, sort of um, haphazardly. Um, we were hanging out with our good friends from Bierstadt in Denver, Colorado. Um, it was the day after the Pills and Love Festival in, uh, in Los Angeles that uh, Firestone put on. And we were just out and happened to stumble upon a Mexican food restaurant. 
And I said, you know what, I'm going to have a Michelada. I haven't had one in a long time. I haven't really seen them around much. And so we all ended up getting it and talking about it. And then we decided that we were going to build a recipe together. So the Bagby Michelada is actually the Bagby Beer Shop Michelada. It's actually a collaboration Michelada. It's kind of funny, kind of different. But um, yeah, uh, for those of you that are familiar, there's several different ways to make this, this, uh, this drink. Um, we kind of went down the road that we wanted to. <laughs> if, you, if anyone's ever been down to Mexico, they make them several different ways. A chilada is basically just lime juice and, and lager. Um, some of the other ones are way more savory focused, like Worcestershire, picture of Worcestershire, and a little other savory stuff, and not much else. Um, so we kind of wanted to pull all the elements that we could, a little spice, a little savory, um, a little fresh lime, um, cracked pepper. Um, we use a, uh, I think it's listed up there. Yeah, Hugo Magi is like a, if anybody's ever seen it in a little Mexican market, it's a little tiny brown bottle with a yellow label. Um, great for a base or, a, or an accent for sauces. <laughs> But it really kind of deepens the the flavor of the michelada. Um, we wanted uh, a little bit of hot, but we didn't want to go too crazy, so we used Valentina. Um, if anybody's ever seen it, I think it's like two dollars a liter bottle at the grocery store, um, <clears throat> and the stuff is great. I put it on just about everything. Um, for sure, again, for a little of that component, uh, we in the past have made a vegan version where we've used uh, vegan Worcestershire. If anybody's ever curious about that, it's obviously it's similar, but that's the only component in the whole drink that has any kind of meat in it. It's just the fish character. Um, a lot of people make Micheladas with Clamato. I can't stand Clamato. <laughs> um, it has uh, clam juice in it. And for some reason, it's shelf stable until I think the rest of us in this room will all be long gone. It, you, know, you could still have a bottle of that and it could quote still be fine. So anyway, we decided to make ours a little more fresh. We use, um, was it R.W. Knudsen's tomato juice? It's 100% juice. doesn't have any additives or different flavors or thinners or anything like that. It's real rich and red. Um, so it's really nice, high quality, 100% tomato juice. Um, and obviously fresh cracked pepper, coarsely ground. And if anybody does want the, the proportions, the ratios, I'm happy to give them out. We were just, because it is a collaboration and I didn't have a chance to get in touch with those guys and see, I was like, well, it's also kind of fun. I feel like to take somebody else's ingredients and go, oh, I'm going to put this up or this down or eliminate this or swap this out. So I figured let's just give them what we put in ours and if you really want the ratios, like I said, happy to give it to you. Uh, but I thought that'd be a little more fun. Uh, the lager, uh, we always use pale lager if we can. We have used our cream ale when we've been out of pale lager, and it works just as well. Um, I will say with the experience, experimentation that we've done, um, hops don't really work in this situation. They really clash with the rest of the ingredients in a big way, and it just kind of makes a mess. It's just not very pleasant to drink. Whereas something like our, our La Chancla, which is a Mexican lager that we just came out with um, last year, late last year, has a high corn content. So it's got a richer character to it. Still has a dry finish, um, you know, attenuates well, but um, really works well with this. And obviously the Mexican style lager, and Mexican style drink um, worked really well too. And um, Proportions, again, depend on um, sort of your your desires, your what, what you like and what you mix. Um, we serve them in these, in a big old fashioned schooner. Um, you can get them at Mexican markets and places like that. Um, but it's just kind of a really nice presentation. Um, our mix to beer ratio, we, we kind of build the cocktail uh, by putting lime juice around the rim of the glass and then dipping that in tahini. Um, some people use chamoy, it was a little much for us, so we just did the tahini and everybody liked it best that way. Um, then we put our, we, we have real cubes at our place that we use for some of our, our other cocktails. So we put those in and we pour in at about 
six ounces of lager. Then we'll pour in uh, four ounces of mix and then two more ounces of uh, lager on top of that. So we kind of have a sandwiched thing. Cause you want, it's nice to have some of that carbonation from the lager still come through in the beer, in the, in the drink. So if you kind of just gently stir, at least you get all of those components mixed up. Then we just garnish with a section of a lime on top and that's it. It's delicious, got a little spice to it, not too much. A little savory character. I didn't even try this one, see yet. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, I like them better in Bloody Marys. Um, although, I don't, I don't know. I don't really drink vodka. I feel like it doesn't have any character whatsoever. So, um, I always make my bloodies with with uh, mezcal or tequila or something a little more flavorful. Um, but yeah, these are great. Um, they're very low in ABV, as Jock was talking about with the Rattler. I imagine we're in the same range of, of ABV. Range. So, good morning drink, good anytime drink, really. Um, so, yeah, that's it. That's the Bagni Beer Shop Michelada. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's available all the time. We also have uh, a Michi Leader, which is basically twice two Michiladas and uh, one of our Mosses, German style Mosses. Que bueno, eh? I was not a Michelada fan until I had this one. I've had a lot of them with that nasty Clamato. I apologize to those of you that like that stuff. Um, I am not one of them. Anyhow, I hope you enjoyed that cocktail. Uh, I love it. And I think I agree with Jeff that it's one that can be made any time. And like all of their other cocktails, they put a lot of love and handmade into everything they do. They did a, an eggnog for the holidays. If you haven't had, if you like eggnog, theirs is absolutely off the charts. So if you're up that way before the month is out, there might still be some left over. They make it every day, fresh. Fresh whipped cream, hand whipped with the bourbon, video. Okay, on to the next. Let's see what's up next. Okay, a little bit about beer cocktails and what happened. There actually is a history of beer cocktail. Uh, and, it, and it goes back quite a ways. As you can see, uh, back in 750 BC, they found in King Midas's tomb evidence of other stuff that was buried along with his glass, which he drank. A mixture of a beer-like thing, whatever it was they made in those days. Uh, and it was pretty nasty, which is how the beer cocktails got started. Because they had to put stuff in them to make them taste at least decent. And the decent taste was better than the water taste that was available to them, which killed off bazillions with dysentery because it was horrible. So, so that's how these all got started. And they used all kinds of other plants and, and uh, bushes and twigs and berries and rocks and stuff to help make their, their, their drinks taste better than what they did. So we're going to fast forward. Uh, I told you I'm not good at math. 1700, 2,500 years and the early 1700s in the United States, where beer was beginning to come into the US. It was getting popular, as were other alcohols, particularly rum, with the trade that took on with the, far, with the West Indies. And in, I'm not gonna read all these. You guys can read them perfectly well. So there was a lot of new drinks coming on, and rum in particular was the big one. Uh, America had become a good producer of cider in the day because there were not a lot of hops available to them. Apples were plentiful, apples ferment by themselves, and they did what they do. Um, so there was a big, uh, being that it was American made, that came up with some crazy names for some of these products that they had in the day. The Rattleskull, a mix of dark beer, rum, 
lime juice, and nutmeg. Sound? God, you guys are easy. Okay. Uh, come in. <laughs> Chris is going to pass around his uh, uh, passion drink. Before we do, though, let me let me keep talking while you're passing. No, please, Judy. Bring them on. I'm going to talk through it a little bit as we're passing these out. You might want to hold off to, to taste them if you don't mind. Uh, but you need some tools. When you're cocktailing, if you guys aren't regular cocktailers like me, you need some tools to do that. And so I thought I'd just talk about some of the tools that you need. Among them are the bar spoon, typically a long-handled, tiny, chipped spoon that you use for serving, for stirring, etc. cetera. Uh, a shaker, so shakers are really important. Um, we, we didn't use shakers in most of these cocktails. I used them in one of mine. I shook it at home and I thought, oh wow, that's a really cool idea because it's a great way to get the drink cold. I realized doing this research for this, there's another reason for having a shaker with ice in it. Anyone have a thought about that? What's that? No, but good guess, Derek. No, you know what it is? I could keep going asking every, it's actually to provide some dilution to the cocktail. Because some of these cocktails can be pretty strong and pretty powerful. And in order to kind of cut some of the power, you put that wad, that ice in, and the ice melts quickly as you're shaking, and your hands begin to freeze, which they say is the time to stop shaking and pour the cocktail out. So that's what the shakers are for. Um, I didn't put a picture of this citrus uh, stripper in it. If you don't know what a peeler looks like, don't make cocktails. Go buy them. Uh, a muddler is for putting, uh, you, you mash fruit, you mash leaves like basil to make a mojito. So a muddler is a pretty important piece of the artillery you need as well. A jigger, that's the measuring deal here, right? Usually one side is one ounce, one side is two ounce, or sometimes it's one and a half and three. Um, and then a mixing glass. So this guy over here, this has become like super posh in a lot of the cocktail places now. They have these really nice cut glass mixers for all these fancy cocktails that they make with the smoke coming out of them and all that. Um, they look nice and they're pretty convenient, but maybe not quite so necessary. Okay, Chris, are you ready? Yeah, I think we've seen that before. All right, everybody. Maryland State. So it's not technically a beer cocktail, although by TTP definitions it is. Uh, so I used a hard seltzer for this. And it's kind of a tiki-inspired drink. It's uh, loosely based on a classic Mai Tai recipe, but swap some of the rums for the passion fruit seltzer and use the passion fruit for the fruit instead of lime. So basically it uses three ounces of the passion fruit hard seltzer from Barrel and Stave, an ounce of silver rum for that I use Plantation Three Star, which is a mix of uh, Barbados, Trinidad, and Jamaican rums. I uh, use half ounce of Pierre Ferrand dry curacao, which is the classic dry curacao that's used in a Mai Tai. Uh, some homemade orja syrup. Uh, that is, it's an almond syrup. Basically, I roast, I roast some almonds and then grind them up and put them in uh, sugar water syrup. Uh, soak that overnight and then press them out through cheesecloth to make this. Uh, Thick almondy syrup, very marzipan tasting. And that's what gives it that kind of hazy color to it. At the end of the slides, I believe there's a link to the recipe for making your own. It is nice to make that up and it'll last for months or years in your fridge. So you can make up a big bottle of it and have it around for making cocktails. A little bit of that goes a really long way. A half ounce, a quarter ounce will be a very prominent change to the cocktail. So you really don't need a lot. If you make you know, a couple of cups of it, it's gonna last you years. And then homemade Mai Tai syrup. So my, the Mai Tai syrup is kind of a demerara sugar, simple syrup. It's 
This is a 2x strength, so two cups of sugar per cup of water using demerara sugar. And that's got a pinch of salt in it, as well as some vanilla. And it comes out tasting like toasted marshmallows. It's really tasty syrup, and a little dash of that goes a long way in giving a hint of unique flavor to the cocktail. And finally, to give it a little bit of bitterness, since we don't have the acidity of the lime to balance, uh, having a little bit of bitterness helps with the passion fruit for, for creating a balance of bitter and slightly tart. So uh, to make this is really simple. Uh, fill a shaker or glass half halfway with ice. Put in all your ingredients except for the seltzer. Give that a good mix with a cocktail spoon or a knife. And then gently add the seltzer to try to preserve some of the carbonation. Stir it around gently and then strain that into a fresh glass of ice. So it'll be nice and cold, slightly diluted and over some fresh ice. Uh, bonus points if you've got nugget ice or crushed ice. Uh, we just had the big bag of Costco ice, so it's up kind of on the rocks tonight. But it is in the picture, you can see that's over crushed ice from my freezer. Or you can use a special mallet, wooden mallet to break up ice yourself. Uh, come Before the ice, it's about 17% ABV. We were guessing it dilutes to somewhere around 12 after the ice dilution. Uh, any questions? So Stan's question is, where's a good place to buy the Demerara sugar? Pretty much anywhere. I mean, sugar in the raw, raw is Demerara sugar. You can get some better stuff at Sprouts and the bulk bins. Uh, most grocery stores will have some kind of uh, raw sugar. Uh, but certainly, you could go to Mexican markets. The question is whether I've done this kegged and carbonated. I have not yet, but it would be pretty conducive to that. Now, since it does have some carbonation, uh, you could mix it all up in a keg and serve that carbonated. Anything else? All right, I'll hand this back over to Jacques. Outstanding, Chris. That's a lot of work you put into all that handmadeness. Uh, way more work than, than I did, frankly, for my stuff. So. Be prepared. So, um, real quick, we're gonna before we get on to our next cocktail, we got to give you guys a chance to enjoy these. A uh, couple of things that are that are pretty important. And one thing, I, I'm a little bit inspired by by Bagby on this one because I, I asked a question there as everybody is like, why do you guys pour all this? Why do you have all these different glasses? Isn't it a pain in the ass? to run your business with all these glasses. And they like to pour their beer in the glass appropriate to the style of beer, which is so perfect because it matches the Bagby program on making beer perfect to style. So if you're gonna do it that way, I think, and it's kind of cool to have good glassware. Again, you can talk to my wife, she doesn't completely agree because you end up with way too much glassware, but it is fun to have a few different styles I think that are important. So you can recognize the mug or stein. Uh, the Collins is, is the tall one. That also is good for a Pilsner type of glass. But technically a Collins has straight sides on. For anybody that likes to drink a Collins. Anyone besides me. Um, the margarita, the Weld margarita. So there's a couple different style of margarita glasses. This one's called Weld. You've probably seen them where it's just a bowl. And then you've been, if you've ever been to Casa de Mandini, where you have the aquarium size. Okay? Uh, those are good too, but you need friends and a lot of friends to help you with those. Regular cocktail tumblers, you guys have probably, you probably have some of these, a short and a tall boy, uh, or highball as they used to call it back in the 50s and the 60s. Um, martini glass, you recognize those. The copper mug for the mules, which are like super popular now, there's, there's a million kinds of mules. For every nationality of liquor, there's a mule that goes with it. And they're all pretty good. Um, and then the ever coveted red solo cup, which can be replaced all of those glasses. So if, if you're just kind of going with limited closet cupboard space, Red Solo Cup, baby. They come in the plastic thing and they're disposable. No washing up. Yes, Derek? Yeah. 
So the three ridges on the red solo cup, the very bottom one is the amount for a shot. The middle one is for like wine. And then the, the tall one is for beer. So they're perfectly made to substitute all of those. I never knew that because I've never done anything but, but like fill them up to the top. And, and I didn't even notice. Who knew? They could have just cut them. Oh, they do have the short ones for the shots. Those are pretty cool. Um, OK. Are we ready on the next cocktail, gang? How y'all doing on these? You need a little bit more time? OK. We're going uh, we're, we're gonna to change the order up a little bit because um, I, I told you about my math challenge that I didn't do the math right when we had, we had, we had a, a last minute addition of another cocktail. That was another 40 cups. And then there were 10 more people than I was told were gonna be here. So that was another 40 cups. And so anyhow, so we're gonna have to uh, wing it. So we're going with all the ice cocktails first. So this is the cocktail that you guys are being served now. I'll wait a moment so it comes around. And you can see what's in this one, one of my all-time favorite spirits of choice. Where? No, it's called Crossing Time. Yeah, that was a typo from the thing that I got it from then. It, it makes more sense. You sure? You have time, what time? I should have sent this to you to, to double check. Banker sends me a list of like 15, 15 mistakes at like 11 o'clock last night. Okay, gang. So this is this this cocktail's coming around. You probably most of you have it by now, except me. Um, that's okay. I I had it last night. So so there's this. I got. I didn't. I didn't come up with. This. I just read this one in this book that I got. And there is a mistake here. Besides Ryan, does anybody know the mistake here? It's at the front table. You guys all cheated because Ryan told you. So the, the album apparently is called Closing Time, not Crossing Time. Anyway, there's a writer who wrote about cocktails named Paul Clark. And he was a Tom Waits fan. And if any of you don't are familiar with the music of Tom Waits, he sounds kind of like this and he sings but not like that. Most of the time, except when he was young. And this song was produced when he was quite a young man, and he sounds uh, like the regular voice guy. Uh, and it's a, it's a very cool, what's this in San Diego? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, OK, Brian? I don't know if it's still around, but there's uh, Napoleon's Pizza down in Chula Vista, no, National City, near the mile of cars down there, where Tom used to work as a youngster. I know, he, I think he went to high school at maybe Helix or something. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, he started in San Diego. Um, he has a song called San Diego Serenade. A lot of history of San Diego. So you want me to kill more time, Jock? Say that again. Well, does that tell you about where he was at? So if you can, so the song is, is, I listened to the song because I was a little inspired after reading this story about it. Um, very wistful. Uh, it's very sort of melancholy sounding. But the drink that Paul Clark used to make this was made with Sam Smith's oatmeal stout, which is the, drink, the, the, the beer that's in this cocktail that you all are drinking now. So it's made up of bourbon, grapefruit juice, maple syrup, and this stout. So what I did was I told you last night, before I put these all together and started preparing the drinks, I, I shook and shook and shook all the ingredients to make the mix. And then we just added this, the, the, the stout here on site so as not to lose carbonation and to have it be freshly poured and all that. stuff. Um, so what you do is, like you said, is you, you fill a cocktail shaker with ice, shake it, shake it, shake it, strain it, add the beer, Stir gently and enjoy. 
on a couple cubes. What did you guys think? It's a pretty good one, huh? You know, it's like it's not too grapefruity. You don't get too much citrusy out of it. The bourbon is sort of mellowed out by the let by the citrus. Louis, I used McHarlan's. Uh, what bourbon did I use? It was McHarlan's 15 years, something like that reserve. Not a very expensive bourbon. Because I don't believe in putting super expensive cocktail or, or spirits in drinks that you're going to mix a lot of stuff into. You want to use a decent one. I wasn't like gentle, like uh, old granddad or something like that, which I could have, I guess, but I didn't. Um, and you're supposed to serve it in that kind of a that kind of a, a glass. So, um, okay, you guys like that one? Cool. All right. Let me. So, so while while the, my, while the team and thank you to my wife Chris and to Judy and Chris for helping prepare all these pours. This was a logistic nightmare, especially for a math challenge guy, because I had to keep changing the ratios as the numbers of people kept going up. So talking about, so technically, again, the, the beer tail does not have liquor in it. So we've had a couple of beer tails tonight. The balance we're going to be tasting are going to be all cocktails, beer cocktails. So, so some famous ones. And I didn't realize all of these were technically beer cocktails before I started going through this thing. And I've had a bunch of these over time. Probably most of you have probably had maybe all of them. Black and tan, obviously, I was definitely not going to do that one because trying to properly pour a black and tan for 40 people at three ounces, I'd be here till tomorrow trying to float that, that, other, that, that dark beer on top. Uh, snake bite, somebody suggested I do a snake bite because that's a pretty common one, uh, beer and cider. Mm. Didn't excite me. The Michelada excited me, as I already told you about, because I tried to want it Bagby, uh, and I'm real excited about that drink. Shandy, I've had a bunch of times, another summer pounder. Uh, Session-y, uh, you can just smash those all day long when you're out at the river. Uh, if it's 100 degrees out, you can drink those. Line and Kugel makes them. Um, uh, there's, who, who's the other guy in Pennsylvania? Um, Youngling makes one. He make, they, they make a summer shandy also. Really delicious. Uh, and there's a, several different flavors of it, right? So the summer is wheat beer. The regular shandy is a regular beer and ginger ale. Black velvet is another common one. In fact, Joe at Bagby's thought about doing the black velvet. And I thought that would be cool, except champagne's expensive. Or just poor black velvet. What's a poor man's black velvet? Sparkling cider. Oh. Oh. So for those of you on Zoom, uh, Raul was suggesting you was doing a poor man's shandy, which a uh, poor man's black velvet, which is a peri, a pear-based cider, and and the, uh, the dark beer. So it's a great option. And a Boilermaker. So, so the Boilermaker was probably one of the first cocktails I may have ever had as a kid. Um, I, was, I was working on, on Wall Street as a, as a runner for a law firm. And there were a couple of old dudes that worked there who were like 117 years old, I think. And I, they were bringing the kid in and I was I was kind of in, in high school and I was working and there was a bunch a bunch of tiny little bars McCann's bars there were like nine of them I think in in like a half a mile radius of the corner of Wall and Broadway where I worked and Ed Egan they were both they were both these British these uh these Irish based, Irish history guys uh, they said hey come on let's go for a quick stop which I found out they did every day. 
every time they'd leave the office to go take a run, delivering manuscripts, serving somebody with papers, what have you, they'd stop at one of these vacants. And they said, come on. So they took me, and I'm, I'm, I think I was 16. And I, I, I had my suit on and all that. And I, I sat up at the bar, and the guy said, yeah, give him one too. And it was a boilermaker. The afternoon was not productive for me. So anyway, we're, we're going to start our next cocktail. Are we ready? Oh, questions. UK version. Oh, thanks. The UK version of beer, and typically it's a lemon soda. Um, in France, they have a similar drink, but they call it a panache. And of course, in Germany, it's the Rattler. So all the European countries mix beer and, and lemon lime soda together. Oh. For those that don't really like the taste of beer so much. Or if you don't like the taste of soda so much. OK. Well, cool. This one is the Ale Punch. All right. So I'm going to go back here a minute. Here it is. All right. So, so this one I picked out of the book because of one ingredient in particular that I tried a couple years ago. I bought a bottle of it, beautiful bottle, and I wasn't exactly sure what this was going to do and why it was there until I went to a, um, I went to a restaurant, I don't know, December, and they made a cocktail. It was a version of, a, of an old-fashioned with some of this St. Elizabeth Allspice Dram, which knocked me out. It was so good. And I realized we were tasting this cocktail, and it's like, wow, this sort of has a cinnamony, allspicy kind of flavor. And I asked them what it was, and they said it was this. It's like, Yahoo, I happen to have a bottle at home. So I found, so this cocktail was among these batches. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's typically made as a punch. So you would chill all your ingredients, put it into a giant punch bowl, and serve it with punch glasses. And you can see the, the ingredients there. I've used uh, Bagby's Copycat Pale Ale. The original recipe called for Sierra Nevada Pale. And I said, pshaw, we have, we have Mr. Bagby's beer close at hand, and it's delicious, so why not? And I made some simple syrup. I squeezed lemons off my tree. And there you have it. Can I have one? It might be. Is there any left? No, it might be gone. We had, we had a few more people than we'd originally accounted for from the RSVPs. Yeah, David? I used dry sherry on this one, and it was Spanish dry. Oh, thank you, Ralph. Yeah, it's a Lustau, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, but it is a dry sherry. Yes, Louis. No. No. So the ABV is not a typo, guys. I calculated it based on um, the calculator that I have and looking at the World Wide Web. That told me how to calculate ABV. So, Raul? It's a liqueur. It's a, it's a 20, I think it's 25.2% ABV is a liqueur. It's made with allspice and it's got, I, I, I don't know how, if it's a, if it's a vodka base that they knock down, but it's, Bevmo has it when they have it. It's a funny thing. It must have gotten super popular uh, this year and appearing in a lot of cocktails near you because it was out of stock at a lot of places. Yes. It is very faintly sweet. It's much more spicy than it is sweet. So if you get that all spicy flavor in here, that sort of cinnamony character, that's the St. Elizabeth Allspice Dram. And it's fantastic in, a, in an old-fashioned, if you want to kind of juice it up a little bit and give it a little twist. Chris? 
So you can make it at home, uh, the Allspice Dram. It does take a few months. Uh, <laughs> let me find the info. I, I've got a bottle at home that I made. It's a good sized batch. You get like a you get Why are we at not least surprised? half a liter out of it. Uh, let me get to the recipe. So quarter cup whole allspice berries, so whole dried allspice, a cup of light rum, a cinnamon stick, one and a half cups water, and two thirds cup brown sugar. Uh, crush the allspice berries and soak them in the rum. And then just steep that for you know, steep that for five days and then add a cinnamon stick and then steep for another week or two or months. And then uh, you're gonna uh, heat sugar and water and add that in and steep it for longer. And then eventually you strain that through cheesecloth and then you can uh, sit on that for a long time. Yeah, simple syrups normally 50 50 next. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that's how you can make it at home. It turns out really great, and it's a great addition to a lot of tiki drinks. Uh, it's one of those classic ingredients that it's called for a lot of tiki drinks. Thank you, Chris. Um, so if you need cinnamon sticks, Chris is growing cinnamon at his house, and it is available on demand. Uh, but you have to wait because you got to buy vanilla with it, which he's made from personally sourced vanilla beans in Madagascar. And that is not a lie. If you don't know that's true, Chris went to Madagascar to get vanilla beans and do a little safari while he was there. Um, Chris, I don't know if you talked about it and your drink, but orgeat syrup and making the orgeat yourself. In, in Chris's cocktail, there's orgeat syrup, and you've probably had it before. They call it like an almond syrup, and you can buy it from, did I already talk about this? Oh, all right. I'm never buying home, I'm never buying store-bought again. So, so pay attention to the slide earlier that you guys will be able to source where the location of the website is to make your own orzat syrup. So quick side note on the orzat syrup is that those, uh, uh, almond and cacao nib cookies I brought were made with the leftover almonds from the orza. So you toast the almonds and grind them up and uh, soak them overnight and press them out in cheesecloth. And I had all these almonds that I felt bad throwing them away. They weren't fully spent. So I made those cookies that have the, uh, the orza almonds in them. There's maybe three left, two left. <laughs> uh, two, two cups. So it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of almonds. And it made a very almond-heavy batch of cookie with all these little bits of uh, ground-up almonds. I think it turned out pretty good. Thank you again, Chris. Okay. So uh, did you guys like that last one, that that uh, Adele Punch? Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see. So I thought I'd share some some statistics and fun facts about how this happened besides uh, Lauren uh, twisting my arm to say, hey, would you like to do cocktails? Yes, please. So this is what we went through in making all of these cocktails. And it's, it's maybe not the entire list, but from the alcohol portion, it is. So a full bottle and a quarter of rum, a, a bottle of rum, a bottle and a quarter of the bourbon that went into this ale punch that we've just enjoyed. Dry curacao. Uh, by the way, we probably don't want to talk about this there because we're probably not supposed to do this here. Okay, you got me? So a little on the DL. Um, so yeah, the dry curacao, a uh, bunch of brandy, the Lustau dry sherry, simple syrup that I made, homemade, and it was water and sugar. Super easy. Uh, grapefruits, lemons. Maple syrup went into one of the, uh, the cocktails. I think it was the grape, uh, the grapefruit moon. Walnut liqueur that we're going to try. It's in the last cocktail coming up. Uh, homemade Mai Tai syrup and the homemade orzat and Chris. And three and a half gallons of beer. So we did pretty good tonight. You guys are an easy audience because you all like to drink. So that's what we did. Um, we're, we're pouring out the last cocktail. Uh, anybody have any questions so far? 
Anybody feeling okay to drive? Drink a lot of water? Yes. The, the question was, could you eliminate the, the hard liquor from these cocktails and just use the beer? Um, what is your name, please, sir? Lewis. Uh, what, what I would say, Lewis, is you probably could, but they're not going to taste the same. If you want to do that and make them uh, virgin, so to speak, you need to figure out what the flavor point is of the liquor that you want to re get out and how could you replace it. So is there a different beer maybe? Uh, is there, I don't know how you'd replace the taste of bourbon, something oaky, smoky. Maybe, maybe use a bourbon barrel aged beer in that one or a barley wine. So yes, I, I would say the answer is yes. If you're not, if you're not a, a, an alcoholic person or you, have, you wanna have something available for the people that don't drink, um, then it's, it's not a bad idea to do that. One thing I'm gonna say, another plug for Jeff at Bagby, they have non-alcoholic cocktails on their menu, which I applaud you because there are so few people that do that around. My wife isn't really a drinker, so when we go out, it's like, you have non-hard kombucha. No, oh God, okay. I'll just have soda and water. So, so having non-alcoholic cocktails is a really good thing, and I would encourage those of you who have spouses or people or friends that don't drink to come up with a cocktail. And there's a lot of them out there that you can find that do not have hard alcohol in them. So good, good question. Is anybody else? Okay. How are we doing? We ready? Almost. No, I'm getting the almost sign. Vanna and, and, and the crew over there have just done a fabulous job. Super duper. So, so coming over now is this recipe for the cocktail called Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I can't tell you why it's called that. I have no idea why. It's kind of interesting. So why would that, what would that have to do with the cuckoo nest? Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. Okay. So as this is coming around, you can see the, the, uh, this recipe was originally designed with Newcastle Brown. And those of you that have had Nuki Brown would know it's a very delicious beer. Somewhat lighter style as a brown goes. Uh, I used to really love it until I started trying some more craft brews. And I personally love this one, this Three Beagles. It's a multi-award uh, winning beer from Bagby. And the recipe technically originally calls for this Nooks Alpina walnut liqueur, which I had a very difficult time finding. So I went to this Nocello instead, which is another walnut liqueur. A little cheaper too, by the way. I went way over the budget that I was allotted for this event. Um, well, no, part of this is, is my gift to the club because I haven't brewed in a long time. And you guys are all generous, and you bring brews, and you share them, and I drink them, and I haven't. So some of this is, is uh, my gift to the club. So anyway, you can see it's a pretty simple recipe. 10 ounce, typically a single cocktail. We're doing three ounce pours. Um, what do you guys, I haven't even tasted this. Beer. Yeah, that's why we decided to pour it up last, because of the walnut liqueur and the Orjat, which I wish I had used Chris's. Who knew? Yes, Louis. Andre's got a microphone for you. 
I was just thinking this, this does finish a little sweet, even though it does have a really nice aroma and everything on it. And so I could see adding some walnut bitters or some other similar sort of bitters uh, to kind of help balance out some of that sweetness. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, really nice. Yeah, it finishes. It is a little sweet. Uh, probably more so than I would normally want. But it's, it's tasty. I mean, it's pretty good. Now I wouldn't pour it down the drain. Yes. I got it at Total Wine and More. Every, yeah, pretty much. Um, I, I probably could have made the drive over to Holiday over in Escondido. And if you guys haven't been there, they've got just about everything. Um, but I didn't want to drive that far. A little lazy, I guess. Um, so this one actually comes in pretty low ABV wise because the beer, which is a low alcohol beer, is so prominent in the makeup of this whole cocktail. So this one's not going to hurt you too bad, but after having all the other ones. So anyway, so that's that's the over the cuckoo's nest. And uh, about the end of my presentation. So these are the, uh, the resources that I, I tapped into to put this together because I really literally didn't know anything about beer cocktails. Uh, I didn't, I, I really didn't. When I started, when I was asked to do this, uh, back in November, of course, I waited until like a week ago to start this. Um, not, not true, exactly. So anyhow, so I, I got these two books that I bought on, online uh, from this used book vendor, uh, and I'm happy to lend them if anybody wants to check them out. These recipes all came out from the Ultimate Guide book. The other one from the, the Speltzers had all of these bizarre beers and bizarre liquors that led me to think that they were from Europe maybe because I had, I mean, all the beers were European beers and it was just getting too complicated. So I, I picked these ones for a couple of reasons. One for kind of the least complicated, knowing that we were gonna have this logistical fun and games going on over here to make this happen. I also resource uh, Jeff uh, Bagby again. Thanks a million to you and your crew, to Joe and to Matt to Andrew at the bar who showed me a bunch of stuff about making cocktails over there and for the beers uh, that went into these things. Awesome, awesome stuff as always. So thank you. And, and to Chris Banker, who is uh, the maker of all things. Thank you, Chris. So Chris, Chris texted me, uh, was it last night or the night before? Can I bring another cocktail? I was like, yeah, sure. So, so we did this, and he's over at, at, his, at his brewery pouring on cr uh, crowlers last night to make this, this today. So thank you, Chris, for that. This is the recipe for the, or, for the Orjat. And if you're, if you're at all interested in putting that in any cocktails, Mai Tais particularly, it's a major ingredient in a Mai Tai. Make your own. That that crap that I used in that other drink, I, I swear to God, I'm going to probably pour it out. Because it's it, there isn't any mention of almond in the name. And to have an almond-based liqueur that has no almond in it is disgraceful. Yes, Laura? Snug Harbor, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're if you're a maker and a crafter kind of guy like I tend to be, because I could buy a lot of these, well not these, but other cocktails pre-made in cans, because which is a big thing right now, and and some of them are actually really good. Uh, if you haven't done it, take a shot on a bunch of them because they're they're pretty darn good, uh, especially in a pinch. Um, but the mai tai syrup recipe is a good thing also to add into a mai tai, which is seems you can put anything with rum, and it's a mai tai, which I love. And, and uh, Google, great resource. I, I could not mention them because I use them for everything. All the pictures I stole off of Google. Um, anyhow, so that's, that's it. Um, anybody have any questions? Any concerns, any comments? Yeah, Matt? Oh, this, this is gonna surprise you because unlike any good chef, 
The answer is zero. The only thing I tasted was that, uh, that grapefruit moon last night. I just had it go with my gut, and, um, and I just, because I couldn't put the whole things together, right? Because it was uh, putting in the beer at the last minute, then I'd end up with all these empty and open cans of beer because I can't, I can't drink that much beer. Well, I can, but I won't. So I, I really didn't. It was, uh, this was, anyhow, a any other questions? Anyway, thank you all for your attention. Uh, throw the cups away, enjoy, and appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so let's give a quick cheers to Jacques for all the hard work he put into this presentation.